When we are children, our parents tell us not to talk about shit. This is a really serious problem. What you don't talk about, you cannot improve. A lot of people call me Mr. Toilet. I'm really proud when I hear that because it gives an identity to the work that I do. 40% of the world population still do not have access to a simple toilet. Shit is like fire. If you manage properly, the fire can cook your meal. If you don't manage it, it burns down your house. If you manage shit, it becomes a fertilizer. If you don't manage it, it kills you. About 90% of all the surface water in India are contaminated by feces. 1.5 million children under five a year in the world die unnecessarily. You have to have clean water, you have to have safe sanitation. A rich man staying next to a slum. The flies doesn't know a poor man from a rich man. So the rich man is probably eating the shit of the poor man. You better help them get toilets or you will eat their shit. Think about it. We are hosting the World Toilet Summit. This has been an international event every year since 2001. The people say, why should I use the toilet? It's fresh air outside. I can chit chat with my friend while I'm squatting there. A big breakthrough will happen when we look at the poor as if they are customer. When we have to sell them products that are very beautiful and sexy. Once this becomes object of desire, if you don't have, you're not keeping up with the Jonas's. We want toilets to become a status symbol for the poor so that they feel proud to own a toilet. Just like a Louis Vuitton handbag. <laughs> Oh, really? We are actually breaking the taboo on sanitation in the global news. World Toilet Day is 19 November every year. We have the big squad. We are protesting the plight of the 2.5 billion people that still do not have access to a toilet. The fact is I think about toilet every moment. A life is only 80 years. I'm 52. If I'm going to spend 28 years consuming ostentatiously just to have a diamond watch that I can't read the time because it's too sparkling, it makes no sense. Doing social work that is creating some impact, I think it's better to die like that. I think we can see the day that everybody on planet Earth will have access to clean toilets any day, any time. <laughs> This morning, I uh, was invited to BBC Breakfast live broadcast and they told me that they will interview me about my work but on one condition that I cannot talk about, I cannot use the word shit. <laughs> so I, I complied, but I felt a little bit constipated. <laughs> but it proves to you that this is the scale of the problem. You are not allowed to speak about something that you go six to eight times a day, and the problem becomes very serious because you can't even admit that you actually have a relationship with the toilets. So today, I want to talk to you about um, the journey to the toilet. I was born uh, 1957, so this is a picture of myself in 1960. I was um, open defecating, and this was because we were a British colony, of course. Right? Now today, Singapore is the third richest per capita in the world. So during this journey, everything became better because our toilets became better and we become healthy and then we are productive, we get vocational training, everything becomes better. So when I was 40, I have already done 16 businesses, made some money, have a wonderful family, four kids and a very beautiful wife. 
And I thought, what do I do next? It's no use to make more money because selling time to buy money is a loss-making business. And I checked out how long does a person live? And the answer is that a man die at 80 in Singapore average, and woman 84. So I start calculating from 40 to 80, I have 14,600 days more to live, and then I will die. So time is the only currency of life. And so I have to start searching for meaning because there's an urgency to live a useful life. And I should stop playing golf and playing computer game and watching television because I don't have much time left to be useful. I start looking for what would be very important to do and I want to see things that are neglected. And I found sanitation is a very big unserved needs. There are two and a half billion people who don't have access to proper sanitation and one and a half million children die unnecessarily. Can you imagine that if a typhoon killed 6,000 people in Philippines, there would be a big outpour of money. Everybody will be so excited and really want to help. But if you tell somebody that 1.5 million children die every year, every single year, which means it takes three days to kill as many people as the typhoon did, and every three days there's one typhoon, nobody feels anything. Because things have to be dramatized. Statistic has no emotion. So how do we solve this problem? Every day, people are defecating in the morning, all the men on one side, all the women on the other side of the road, and the flies visited the shit and transfer it to food, and children get diarrhea, and all kinds of problems. So how do I turn a subject that is so disgusting into a media darling? I use humor. And in 2001, on 19 of November, I create this movement. It's like a bowel movement. <laughs> and I create this organization called the World Toilet Organization. There were a risk in it because I thought if we were to play a pun on World Trade Organization, calling ourselves WTO, then the media will write about it. And if they sue us, the media will write more about it. <laughs> so there's no downside, and it works very well eventually. So what happened is the media wrote so much about it that all over the world, it became a movement that people take up for themselves and created World Toilet Day um, massively. This is in Sydney, in Amsterdam, in Bangalore, they make um, parade and protest. In Uganda, uh, that was during the time when there is a World Cup in South Africa. I thought this is a wonderful opportunity because the acronym of World Cup is actually WC. <laughs> I don't know why, everywhere I go I think toilet, so <laughs> all this kind of opportunity keeps popping up. Right? So we started the World Toilet Cup and and Africans are really crazy about football, so that's also very popular. Last year, the mayor of Solo City in Indonesia closed down nine kilometers of their downtown street to create a World Toilet Carnival. So every, it's like National Day over there. All the Army, Navy, all the contingents are com coming out, and they even have a parades like this, and this is very, very inspirational for the people to start to address the subject because it's very, very fun. We have World Toilet Summit every year. Here's the Crown Prince of Holland, the Prince of Orange, who um, graced our occasion, and eventually he became the King of uh, Holland last year. So I don't know if there's any relationship with his promotion. <laughs> Couldn't claim any credit. We have the president of uh, India also taking, uh, opening the World Toilet Summit. So in reality, you can see 
by creating a movement and giving ownership to other people, you start to create a lot of legitimacy. And all these are done with a budget of zero. I don't have any dollar on this. It is by telling story, getting the media, spreading the news, kind of like the spreadsheet model. <laughs> and everybody start to take up. And all this, all this World Toilet Summit every year is actually not organized by me. I just go out giving hosting rights to a different city each year as if I'm an Olympic authority. <laughs> and then they organize it. It's really effective. Come, uh, come to my breakout session, I'll tell you more. Uh, this is in Moscow. We have the World Toilet Summit in the Parliament House of uh, Moscow. So I don't speak Russian, but we work through the uh, secret uh, police and it works very well. <laughs> this is the uh, space station Mir, and uh, there you can see the, how the cosmonauts recycle all the water in the toilet to drinking water, and also how they pee in their pants when they go outside on spacewalk. In 2005, we hosted the World Toilet Summit in Belfast. The Lord Mayor of Belfast didn't have money, but we used the IRA disarmament money from the American <laughs> Island International Fund. So how do you relate IRA disarmament with World Toilet Summit? So I told the mayor that uh, hosting World Toilet Summit one day after all the rifles are, are put down uh, shows that the city is now open for international business. <laughs> and uh, it works. <laughs> so <laughs> here is the uh, World Toilet Summit in the Parliament House in, in Belfast. And we even asked the Lord Mayor <laughs> to become the Lord of the Rings. So if you don't ask, you don't get. And when you get it, it's really, really uh, powerful pictures. So we get some accolades along the way. And then other organizations that are very large join in. So this is uh, UNICEF and then WaterAid. So the president of Liberia, Nobel Prize winner Sir, Sir Leif Johnson, went on national television on World Toilet Day to talk about the importance of sanitation. You see, if they would have succeeded, the Ebola problem would not be so big because Ebola crisis is basically a hygiene crisis. Matt Damon came to say that he would never go to the toilet anymore unless this problem is solved. <laughs> of course, he lied, but it was a very powerful message. <laughs> Later on, Bill Gates start to put up a lot of millions of dollars reinventing the toilet. So you can see legitimacy gives safety to people to join the movement and then things happen with a life of its own. This year I went on national television with uh, Salman Khan, uh, Bollywood top stars. So there are three Khans, Shah Rukh Khan, Amir Khan and Salman Khan. <laughs> So I got, them to, uh, got him to unbutton his shirt and raise uh, 140,000 on the spot. <laughs> we also got President Clinton uh, endorsement on our work. So we, can, we did a fundraising, which means that President Clinton give you a photograph and you do the fundraising. <laughs> Last year, I went to the UN together with our Singapore government as a member of the UN to lobby for our founding day to become the UN World Toilet Day. We lobbied 193 countries and eventually it was unanimously passed and forever World Toilet Day is 19th of November. So it's actually very interesting and very encouraging for you that you can do a lot of things just by telling stories. Because if you can make people believe, just like before, logos, ethos, and pathos, if you can create that, then things happen. 
when a belief system happens. So now our second part of our talk, I want to talk to you about uh, how to end global poverty. There are 7 billion people in the world, but only 3 billion are in our former economy. Everything that is produced and sold are to only 3 billion people. The other 4 billion are called the base of the pyramid, off-grid, they are outside our former economy. They earn less than $10 a day, but they are not being served. So if we look at these 4 billion poor people, as customer, the timing today is perfect because the top of the pyramid is very saturated and people want to sell to new customers. But the world is dysfunctional and distorted and fragmented. The foundations are giving money but not empowering people to teach them to fish. They are giving them a fish and that's not sustainable. In fact, it creates the market price of zero which means that no entrepreneur can compete with the market price of zero, no jobs is created, and the economic power uh, multiplier effect cannot happen. The UN is, of course, very good at making declaration, but they stop after that. <laughs> the NGOs are very hardworking, but they are always broke. The universities does a lot of research, and once it's published, the professor gets their tenure, and then that's the end of it. The multinational wants to go into the base of the pyramid, but they don't know how to do it last mile distribution. The social entrepreneurs have very good ideas, but they never go to scale because they are too small. And uh, uh, governments are generally followers of the market. If the market works, they will follow the markets. So we have to lead them. And finally, the uh, development banks, they loan big bulky chunks of money and they are not the right size for the new market development. So what happened is that good models continue to be island models. It also means that all this fragmented inefficiency is a wonderful opportunity to cut waste. So the world, uh, my, I started a BOP hub to create a machine that brings everybody together to work in synchronization so that we can have a zero waste situation just like nature. In nature, you learn that, that everybody uses everybody else's residual. So somebody's shit is somebody else's fertilizer. And then the um, food chain, small animal eaten by bigger animal, and then the whole food chain go out. So, we design instead a world that have winners and losers. We only bet on winners and we neglect the loser. This is a very stupid system. What we need to do is to see not winner and loser, but everybody having a role. And if we can map and place everybody into a role, just like an ecosystem on this picture, then we will respect everybody for their role and not for the egos. The market needs, the poor needs energy, jobs, housing, water, ICT, loans, nutrition, entertainment, medical devices, mosquito net, everything. Everything that we need, they need. And so the marketplace is actually very, very large. We started teaching people to produce toilet, $2,000 to set up a factory, and then they start making money the payback period is 10 months, and after that, they have a complete profit. So people start selling toilets uh, to people in Cambodia, and then we teach them in India, and the whole model keeps on spreading. Here are the open air factory, which cost $2,000, and the picture below uh, our sales girl, who are uh, earning $2 every time they sell a toilet. So when a woman have income, they go home with money and they get respect from their husband and they can speak a little bit more uh, powerfully with their mother-in-law. <laughs> so when we have good ideas, we want to share it so that it grows like fractals. In nature, everything grows by fractals. So if we keep on repeating it, sooner or later, there will be a lot of local entrepreneurs dealing with big entrepreneurs and medium entrepreneurs and eventually people will get out of poverty. The BOP hub model 
is to make everything integrated so that you go cheaper, faster, better, easier, and we can cut um, time, money, share innovation, share due diligence, and scale up distribution. We also can cut a lot of consultancy money because what does consultant do? They ask you to show them their watch, your watch, and tell you the time, right? <laughs> so in reality, when people are trading directly, you save a lot of that. We, what we want to do is to change all the government funding for ODA, uh, development assistance, into economic empowerment to teach people to fish rather than to give them fish. Growing up from Singapore, I'm fully confident that it's possible because I was living on an ATEP, in an ATEP house on, on the black and white photograph and eventually we have 100% home ownership in Singapore. And the whole idea was to train people vocationally and never to give anybody anything for free. Nothing is for free and then the good work ethics happen. The BOP Hub has four offers. First, we make the first World Trade Convention for the BOP meeting, and then we find good models and accelerate it. We supply them with a back office, shared services center, and we created a design center so that everything can be continuously designed together collaboratively all over the world. So this happened last month in Singapore, the BOP World Trade Convention, it went very, very well because everybody is able to trade and collaborate with somebody else. The trade show, the partnership, the workshop, and the plenary. So these are some of the products, and we can really supply a lot of products if we all come together. What we want to do with Accelerator is that everybody who needs somebody else's resource can be connected. So in the same way I leverage the whole world to solve the toilet problem, you can leverage everybody else to come together with you and you with them to solve the problem. So good ideas can go to multiple places rather than just stay growing organically. And we can do supply and demand efficiency by doing co-buying so that everything will be cheaper when we buy together in large quantity than break the bulk. I'm investing in a 65,000 square feet design center, and this will be in Singapore. And when it's built, we will have, it will be open 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It will not close, and it will continuously discuss and collaborative work with every other centers around the world. So this will make the speed of going to market from problem identification to design solution to procurement, field testing and, and, and distribution, collaborative altogether. And those people who need to sleep, we have Japanese capsule beds. And those who don't need to sleep, we have coffee. <laughs> the end result is that we want, this is the end result, the happy, healthy, loving family that are dignified. And the way to do it is that when everybody comes together. Thank you very much. Thank you.